Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If you have your Bibles, grab them real quick. I'm limited on my time, and I want to make sure I get this word in you. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. For morning by morning, new mercies I see. And all I have needed, Thou have provided, and great is Thy faithfulness. Has He been faithful to anybody in here? Oh, great is Thy faithfulness. Early in the morning, Lord, great is. Faithfulness, you Lord, to me. You got your Bibles? Go to go to the book of Luke, chapter twenty-two. Hallelujah! Great is your faithfulness, God. We thank you for this opportunity to come together. And experience your presence, to be fed by your word. Father, we are a needy people when it comes to you. It's in you that we live. It's in you that we move and we have our being. And so we saturate ourselves in your presence and in your word today. Father, speak a word that will change the courses that some of us are on. Father, give us a paradigm shift so that we can see things through your eyes. And let this mind that is in Christ Jesus also be in us. Open up the eyes of our spirit, the ears of our spirit right now to receive what you have to say. Everybody say amen. amen. All right, let me dig into this real quick. This is going to be good, y'all. Y'all ready? Look at somebody and say, baby, you better be ready for this. That white boy don't come in up here loaded up. <laughs> I know it. Now, listen, I got my, my, my assistant back home got me this little piece so I can get down here and talk with you and eat with you, you know. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. I'm going to just start reading, okay? And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, you know when the Lord calls your name twice, you better listen up. He said, Simon, Simon, he says, behold, in other words, take notice and understand the word says, in all thy getting, get understanding. So that's what he's saying. He says, I need you to understand what's about to happen right now in your life. Because if you don't understand what's about to happen, you will get a misperception about your life and think that God has forgotten about you when he's really working for you. And so he says, Simon, Simon, behold, take notice. Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift. Somebody say sift. Yeah. Sift you as wheat. He said, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. You are the key, Simon. I'm just going to work this thing. Look at somebody one more time and say, you're the key. See, I'm anxious to get into this, but before I do that, I want to go back and just take notice of this. He says, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, let me just put that on in West Side terminology. Basically, what Jesus was telling Simon Peter is Satan is coming into your life to subtract from you. See, we talk about addition and multiplication, but we don't talk about subtraction in the church. And that's why you have a lot of Christians who don't have longevity because they think just because they're serving God and coming to church and paying their tithes and paying all, that everything's going to be pie in the sky. But the truth of the matter is, is you come into this, this wonderful edifice right here and into the presence of God to hear a word that will change your life. What, what did he say? I remember when Jesus was talking, he was talking to God. Can I just talk to y'all like I do with my kids? What did Jesus say? He, told, he, he said, he says, I am the, I am the vine. He said, my father is a vine dresser. And he says, those who do not bear fruit, 
he cuts them off. I want you to understand something. There's a difference in being cut off and cut on. So he says he has come to clean the vine. And any branch that is of me that is not producing fruit, he says, I'm going to cut them off. Drag them into fire so they may be burned. But this is where we really got to pay attention to all the faithful Christians. Pay attention to this right here. He also says, he says this. He says, and the branches that do produce fruit, I also subtract from them so that they may produce much fruit. So the key is, is God is not, brought you all this way and have you in a place like this, this pivotal time in your life, just for you to just be a Christian. He wants to make you the key. Let's talk about the key. I wish, anybody got a nice set of keys on them? I'm, I'm talking about some, somebody got a lot of access. Like a big old ring. That's perfect, right? There. Oh, this is good too. But that was looking good. I was coming to get that first lady. Now, I want to just, can I teach just a little bit? I call it treaching. I do a little bit of teaching and preaching, just mix it up. But I really feel like I need to get this word in you because oftentimes when we come to Christ, we think that everything's just going to be tiptoeing through the tulips and everything's all good. But the truth of it is, is God will process you. He will process you. And he will, and, and you got to be careful what you pray for because when you start praying for God to use you, he first will process you before he will use you. And if you want the promotion without the process, you'll never be able to hold on to it if you get it. Y'all going to make me work today. That's all right. I'm coming for you. I'm, I'm coming down your alley, Sally. Now this, you got to understand, I wish y'all probably don't, can't do it on the media team. If you could pull up an image of a blank key. Just see it, if you can, if, if you can, don't worry about it. So this, this right here, this was a key before it was cut. It was a blank key. Just a piece of metal. That's all it was. It's a blank key. Wasn't no good for nothing, but it's still a key. Isn't it crazy in church? We look at people, and because they've not been processed right, we look at them like they're just discarded from the community. But what you got to be careful about judging blank keys. Because blank keys will slip up on you. And the same people you met on your way up, you might have to look at on the way back down. Because God don't look at us as a blank key. He looks at us as potential. And so you're a key. Your life may feel blank right now. You may feel like you're no good for nothing. I'll never forget, man, when I was a kid. I'm going to come back to this. Can I set them right here? Let's see which one I want. I'm going to choose one of these. You know all these pastors. I go to these pastors, Bishop, and they say, he's my, he's my new son. I said, well, if I'm a son, I need some keys or something, you know, <laughs> get my inheritance. <laughs> then they start backpedaling off that son stuff. <laughs> I'm just serious. So when I was strung out on drugs, I was bad, y'all. I was horrible. Armed robbery charges, assault charges, drug trafficking. I mean, just the list goes on and on. I started going to juvenile detention when I was 14. My mom and dad would drop me off on Friday nights after school, and I would spend the whole weekend in juvenile detention. I'd get out on Sunday nights just long enough to go catch Sunday night service. And then I'd go to school through the week, and I'd go back to spend my weekends. I had to spend like two months of weekends because, you know, they had to let me go to school. So I'd do my time on the weekends. And um, I was just such a mess. I'm talking about a mess. Be careful how you look at blank keys. I'm going to work this thing. I hope you all ready. I'm digging in. See, so you got to be careful how you look at people because they're, they, they've not been processed, processed yet. And if you're not careful, you can assess a person's future by your by their present circumstance. You see what kind of car they're driving right now, you think they're going to always drive that same car. You see them strung out, you're going to think they're always strung out because we judge by what we see. But God sees us as potential. You might be a blank key right now, no good for nothing, but all God's got, all you got to do is give God access to cut on you. I'm going to come back to that. 
I'll never forget one of the most productive conversations my dad had with me uh, was when he really told me that you a blank key. And I'll never forget, I was supposed to show up at his house like four or five days in a row to handle a little business for him and haul a tractor over to one of his friends. And I kept telling him I'd be there tomorrow. I was so strung out on cocaine. I was up for weeks. And um, I kept telling him I would come thinking I would get cleaned up and be able to go. I'll never forget one morning I'd been high all night long, hallucinating, thinking people were following me and all that. I was just high. And people just going to work. I was thinking they were following me, you know. <laughs> Sleep deprivation. I don't know if it was that or the dope. But either way, I was so strung out. And I finally got myself together, and I went over to my dad's house, and it was early, 6 in the morning. I pulled up, and he had this little balcony out in front of his house in the driveway. And he stepped out there, and he, he was just shaking his head. I'll never forget that look on his face, like, you just ain't good for nothing. You've been telling me you're going to show up. I mean, your word ain't nothing. No dependability. I mean, you're just a mess. That was the most productive conversation my dad ever had with me because it made me look inwardly and understand that I had to go through a process to get to where God promised me. You know, this key here, and I'll tell you something, it's very frustrating when you have a loved one, someone that you really care about that's being processed and they don't realize it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know God is dealing with them, but they keep kicking. What they say? It's hard to kick against the pricks. You know, you know how, that, how that scripture came. When the oxen would kick against the plowman, that plowman, when he'd kick that hoof up, he'd take a long nail on the end of a stick, and he'd jab it right into the hoof of that cow. And that's what the writer said. He said, it's hard to kick against the pricks. I'm going to tell you, it's frustrating to watch somebody that you love go through a process, and they too oblivious to even understand what's going on. Too oblivious to know that God is jerking the slack out the rope. And if you don't get it together, you're going to fall flat of your face. It's very hard to watch. And so I'm, I'm going I'm to tell this story, and I'm going I'm to leave you all alone. So one night, I, um, I decided I was going to sneak out. I was about 15 years old. Didn't even have my license to drive. This all right, Apostle? Jerome, I'm okay? My dad always taught me, make sure you... Connect with the pastors while you're speaking. If they look got that weird look on their face, just put the mic down and go sit down somewhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm all right right now. <laughs> I got my security with me. <laughs> so one night I decided to slip out. My dad had, my brother had this 78 El Camino. That thing was so clean. And uh, I, I was like, I'm going to slip out the house tonight. My buddy, my older friend, he ran a club down in Nashville. And so I slipped out and drove all the way down there. Boy, I was just having me a good time. He was buying me some drinks and things. And I was just having a good time. I'm just being real with y'all. You know what I'm saying? That was B.C. Before Christ. You got A.C. now. This is after Christ. But let me talk about B.C. first. You know, because a lot of people don't want to talk about B.C. They want to make you think they always been squeaky clean all their life. I wish you would show me your scars so it would encourage me to why I'm going by through my stuff. I can see that if you made it, then I can make it too. That's just a footnote. So I went out there. I got out the car, went in there, and my buddy was buying me some drinks, got me in the club and everything. I was 15 years old. I thought I was just the it. And so, I don't know, it was probably around 2.30, 3 o'clock. I was thinking, man, I need to get home because my dad could whip like nobody. And I was thinking, my dad is going to beat me if I don't get home. So I went out to the Call, you know, I'm feeling good and had me a good time about to get away with this. And I go looking and I can't find my keys. And I started sweating, you know what I'm saying? I was already, I was already feeling that whooping to my bad side. I didn't got home yet. And I was feeling around for my keys and realized that I had locked my keys in the car. So man, I'm panicking. I'll run back into the house, I'm into the club, and I told my buddy, I said, Man, you got to help me. I said, Man, my dad's going. Whip me so bad. I said, y'all won't see me for months if my dad catches me. <laughs> Anybody ever had some mom and daddy like that that could really lay it down? Yeah. Lay it down. <laughs> <laughs> so I went out there, and I, I realized that I had forgot my keys and locked my keys. And so I went in. I said, man, he said, just go to the car and wait there. He said, I'm sending. I'm going to call a locksmith. He's coming over there. So the locksmith come over there, and, uh, and he drives up in this little minivan, and um, I'm thinking to myself, man, 
you know, he's taking his time getting out and opening up the back door. And I'm thinking, bro, I got, I'm dealing with time right now. Yeah, I'm in a waiting process. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Anybody? See, that's why you got to be careful is you don't let time get on your mind. You ever been there when you when you needed God to do something? You waiting on your bow ass. Some of you single women waiting on your bow ass. Say, Jesus, you do realize I'm getting older while I'm waiting. You hear me? You, you, you ever heard that story about that lady, that young lady? She started making a list of what she wanted her husband to be like. She made a list of about I want him to be six foot fine, and have a good job, and making good money, and nice house, and all this stuff. She waited about 10, 15 years. She's she started talking to Jesus. She said, Jesus, I'm getting a little older now. As so long as she waited, she started checking stuff off the list. She said, Lord, don't worry about a job. I, I pay the bills. Lord Jesus, I need you to just go ahead and send him on. I'll work with him, okay? I'll just work with whatever you get. <laughs> some of y'all got some, some visuals coming for you right now. <laughs> but I was dealing with time, and I was like, man, come on, bro. You, he did not feel my pain and my urgency. You ever been in an urgent situation and nobody felt your pain? And so I'm thinking, man, please. So he gets out, opens up his van. He goes over there with a flashlight, and he opens up. I want you guys to pay close attention. This is some good stuff that will help you because we're all in process. right? Now. Whether you want to admit it or not, whether you want to work with him or not, you're still going to be processed. And I'll tell you something. Your response to the process that God has assigned to your life will dictate how long you stay there. I'll say that one more time. Your response to how God is processing you will dictate how long you stay in the heat. Do I need to say it one more again? If you don't respond to how God is trying to give you access in life and push you forward in life, you will waste your time to end up in the winter years of your life wondering what you spent your youth on, what you spent your energy on, what you sacrificed for what. Because all you did was fight the process. And so I did not realize that the locksmith had come there to process a key that would give me access. Because keys are given to people for access. Look at somebody say, I'm the key. I may, I may be blank right now. But after I'm processed, I'm going to have access. And if you, don't expect, if you do not respect the process, don't expect access. I'm going to go over here and talk to this group over here. If you don't respect the process and what God has called you to walk through, don't ever expect access. It's, you, don't Listen, we don't want to hear you blame your daddy. We don't want to hear you blame your mama. We don't want to blame, we don't want to hear you talk about you was on that side of the track. Listen, suck it up, ride it out. I've been going to the prison a lot lately. Now, when we go out on the yard, when I come on there to do my chapel services, I walk out on the yard and all the ladies, they, they look at because I preach the message, ride it out. When I walk out on the yard, they all look at me and say, Pastor Wes, we riding it out. And sometimes that's what you got to do. You got to just sit back, shut up, and ride. Some of y'all frustrated because you thought God was going to pick you up in a Bentley to get you to the next glory. And he showed up in a Pinto with hubcaps. And you sitting on the curb and going to stay on the curb because you don't like the vehicle that he has assigned to your life. I'm trying to preach to somebody in here. You fighting the process that's supposed... Oh, God, I feel like preaching already. I got to get back to my teeth. You are fighting the very vehicle that is designed to get you into the next dimension that God has for you. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Buckle up your seatbelt and ah, I feel it now. Y'all working with me. Come on, preach with me. Look at somebody say, I'm just riding it out. I, I may be going through some hell right now, but I'm just riding it out. I may not know what's going on with my marriage right now, but I'm just riding it out. I may be strung out right now, but I'm going to ride it out. I may not have the money I need right now, but I'm going to ride it out. If he brought me this far, I know he ain't going to leave me here. He never forsake me. He'll never leave. No weapon formed against me will be able to prosper. I need my three Three, four people in here to give God glory for 30 seconds that he thought enough of you to put you through the process. All right. All right. Let me keep working. Mm. No, my dad and I, we build old cars and, and most motorcycles and stuff. 
I got some real cool stuff. I'm talking about old stuff. You know, and nowadays they got all the fuel injection stuff. But back in the day, they had what they call carburetors. And you could have all the boat, you could spend all the money you want to on the motor. But if that one thing on the top of that motor, if that carburetor wasn't adjusted right, all you had was a fast car that wouldn't go nowhere. But there was a little screw on the side of that carburetor. And you had to be real careful when you started adjusting those carburetors. Anybody can know what I'm talking about in here? I, oh, we got some young people in here don't even know what a Pinto was. But, but my dad and I, we get, we get to talking trash sometimes. I say, Dad, let's go get the straightway right here. We're in the country. Let's go. He has 67 Firebird, about 560 horsepower. I got a 68 Mustang. Both of them drop tox, 22s on the back, air ride, everything. I know that car belonged to a, to a brother because when I bought it, the right shoulder automatically leaned in just like that. We got out there racing. My dad, I, he's getting me about a half car. So I pulled over, and I realized, as the elderly gentleman told me, he was a master at tuning a carburetor. He said, when you tune your carburetor, don't make big adjustments. Just slight adjustment. And sometimes we're so intimidated by the process that God has taken us through because it looks so insurmountable. But really, the truth of it is, is you're so close, all you need is just a slight adjustment. When, the, when your husband gets mad at you and starts running that mouth, just look at him and say, slight adjustment. See, see, some of you not that far off. You right there at it. All you just need a little. Y'all going to be preaching that slight adjustment. So every time I do this, y'all going to do. We do this right here? You got to put a little drag on that ride. Ride it out. There you go. Be good, good. So we go in there, and he, he started shining the light in the lock. And I'm like, what are you looking at the lock for? I need the key. But see, the locksmith understood that the key has to be cut in the image of the lock. Romans 8, 29 says, those who he foreknew, who he also predetermined for them to be conformed into the image of Christ. See, that's all Christianity is about, is becoming more like Christ. Because the more you become like Christ, the more you're cut into the image, and it gives you access. Brother, it's all right. Y'all can praise him later on. I know y'all listening. So he went over there. He started looking at the lock because he knew that it was, it was stupid to try to start cutting the key when he didn't know the image that it's supposed to be cut into. So he looked at the lock, and he assessed the tumblers and how they needed to fall into place to open up the door and give access. So he looked at the lock, went back to his truck. I'm still over there just like, I'm I want to take the key and do it myself. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been there? You know God's process. You're like, Jesus, you're taking too long. Just give, give me my stuff back. And then you spend two more years going in a circle because you took something out of somebody's hand who knew how to do it and tried it yourself. Am I talking to anybody in here? I can't help it. I get excited about it. Because you know the scripture says that God's spirit will not always strive with man. The reason why I got Holy Ghost chill bumps on me right now is because he's still striving with me. The last thing you want is for him to just say, you know what? You ain't even worth the process. You fighting the process. You wearing me out. I'm trying to get you to heaven, and you over here fighting the process. So he went over there. He took the key. He took a blank key. It was still a key. It just didn't have any access yet. See, see, some of you are still the key, and you're letting people around you tell you you don't have what it takes because they're looking at a blank key. But what the truth of it is is they don't see what God has in store for you. My scripture says, I has not seen, ears have not heard. So he took that blank key, and he went in there, and he started cutting that key. And he had taken, he'd go over there, put it in the lock, try to turn it. No, not yet. He went back over there and started cutting on it some more. Cutting on it. Yeah, we don't talk about subtraction. 
But when God, God's math says this, when I get ready to multiply you, I first cut you back. And so he took the key, cut it twice, went over there and started trying to open a box. Still no good. And he, he encouraged me that one time. I thanked, I thanked him for that. I said, I'm, I'm close. He went back and started cutting on it again. About the third or fourth time, I don't remember because I was ticked at that moment. And he went over there and he finally got that key in there and he got in there and he got almost a half a turn. Pulled it out and says, I got it. I said, what you mean you got it? Said, yeah, it's still locked. I said, the key did not turn the lock, bro. What do you mean you got it? He said, well, I got it cut into the image of the lock. But he says, now I've got to go buff off the burrs on it. I got to buff the rough edges off. So when I put the key in there, it turns with no energy, no effort. It's effortless. See, when you let God cut on you and then buff you up, things that used to be hard for you, ain't nothing but a, come on, y'all, slow on me now. It ain't nothing but a, so just, might be going through some process right now. And I know y'all used to me hollering and hooping and all that stuff, but I want to make sure I get this word in you. Do not mistake God's process as rejection. He has not forgotten about you. Matter of fact, Jeremiah 29, he says, I know the thoughts that I have concerning you. He, in other words, I ain't forgotten about it. You the one that forgot about it. I'm still me. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I still want to do what I said I was going to do years ago. But until you get your life in line, I'm not going to do nothing for you so that I can watch you fall on your face because you can't take the power and the promotion because you don't have the character. So you gift to make room for you, but the character is what keeps you in the room. And, and I don't want to, some little trickle here and trickle there. When I get under the auspices of my promotion, I want it to be perpetuated. You follow me? I want my kids to live off of my blessing. I want my kids' kids to live off of my blessing. And you can't expect to hold on to something when your bags have holes in them. It look like you're in the doctor's office in here. It's going to be all right. Just hang with me. You're going to feel better after this. It don't feel good, man. And I'll tell you what's really tough is when you're out in the public eye. I love what I love this, the story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna shut up. I love the story about Jesus when he's walking down the road with his disciples and he saw the blind man. You know how church folk are. The disciples was like, Jesus, why the man's blind? Did his mama sin or his daddy sin? You know, because church people, when you're going through something, they think you done did some sinning. Yeah, they must be back on them drugs down on the corner or something. Hey, something ain't right. He said, Jesus, why is a man blind? He said, he said, is it the sin of his mother, his father? He said, no. He said, it's for the glory of God to be made manifest. And sometimes God will victimize you for his glory. <laughs> this thing is blessing my soul today. See, when you shift your paradigm and sell out to the fact that God loves you and he has nothing but good thoughts for you, when you sell out to that fact and you don't vary in that at all, what happens is you start realizing that when horrible crises come to your life, it's only to make you better. We sing about it. We talk about it. But it's hard to live about it. Man, when it starts coming, when trouble starts coming from every side, let me tell you something. You're doing everything you know to do to make things better, and it's still jacked up. You done went to every doctor you know. You've been, you've exhausted your resource, and you still got issues going on. You're like, Jesus, have you forgotten about? Let me tell you, he ain't forgotten about you. He's just getting you ready for something. Because what God wants to do in your life, you got to be cut into the image of his son so that you can walk up to the cross and say, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. I may not have everything I need need but I know if he put me to put it on me he knows I can take this thing so I'm just gonna oh please gonna give me a hearty win come on one more time I'm just gonna because all it is is a touch two or three people say you to keep preach to him come on prophesy say you to keep baby just hang in there 
Just ride it out. You're going to be better after this. God's going to do a miracle in your life. People ain't going to know what to think when they see you walk in the room. You're going to have favor back. You're going to have swagger back. You're going to have your dignity back. You're going to get your peace back. You're going to get your joy back. You're going to get your husband back. You're going to get your wife back. You're going to get your kids back. You're going to get the cat back, the dog back, the car back, the house back. All I need is for two or three people to come into agreement with me that this ain't nothing but a test. This ain't nothing but a trial. He's get, get, getting me ready. He's getting me ready for something great. If you believe it, give God 30 seconds of praise in here. And let the devil know I'm still here. I've been through hell, been through high waters, but I, I'm still here. Hey, still here. I'm done. I don't know who this mic's going to after this. I want to leave you with this. I've been around the church all my life. I didn't say I was in it all my life. I said I've been around it. And I've watched my mom and dad were passing their first church when they were 21, 22. And I've watched for years, 40 years. I've watched people serve in the church, committed to the church. I mean, you, I mean they, they, they dotted all the I's, crossed every T, and served for years and years and years and get right on the threshold of what they've been believing God for all those years. And fall out and get in trouble and quit. It's just a slight adjustment. Don't let the enemy intimidate you. You're that close. You are that close. And if you let the enemy get in your ear, he will intimidate you and make you think it's too big for you. And those people, think they got a different Holy Ghost than you got. The devil rebuke you, devil. Rebuke yourself. Let me tell you something. Don't doubt what God said about you in a dark place. You're going through a dark place right now. You're going through surgery right now. God's working on you. Don't get up. Because surgery is one thing, but recovery is different. A lot of people who go through the surgery, but they don't go through the recovery. And then scar tissue starts building up. You understand where I'm coming from? Anybody get this word today? Raise your hands. I want to speak a blessing over you. Raise your hands as a sign of reception. Lord God, I thank you for my brothers and my sisters. I thank you, Lord God, for the destiny that is upon their life. I thank you, Lord God, for their future. And I thank you, Lord God, that you have always allowed your spirit to strive with them. Father, take them into this next dimension in their life. Father, give them the courage and the strength to press through. Father, give them a press anointing to push through any kind of opposition in Jesus' name. And, Father, right now I speak against every generational curse. Whatever it is, Father, every generational curse, I break that right now in the name of Jesus. Let your word, Father, seep into the spirits of your people and help them to understand that the best is yet to come. And I release life according to Proverbs 18, 21. I have the power to release life. I release life over their finances. I release life over their marriages, their family, their children, education, strength, healing, health. I release that and prophesy over that, over them that right now in the name of Jesus. If you receive it, say, I believe, I believe. and I receive. I believe. God bless you. I love you so much. Look forward to coming back. Thank you, Brother Jerome, for working out. Apostle, now you just need to go ahead and boot them out. Serve them eviction notice. Say, I love you, but you got to go.